Frankie Pilleri, he's the new Marlins director of amateur scouting, and he comes over from the Seattle Mariners, where he spent six seasons in their scouting department. He joins us now on the Marlins Hot Stove Show. Frankie Steven Strom here. Welcome to Miami. Thanks for making the time. How's everything going today? So far, so good. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You've got quite the story. I mean, you, you've done a ton of different things, a plethora of things uh, as far as baseball goes. Uh, scouting, you were a writer at some points, an analyst. Give us your journey, when it started, and why it started um, in baseball. Yeah, it's been a bit of a winding road, but I, I, I'm proud of the story for sure. For as long as I can remember, I knew I wanted to break down and analyze baseball players in some form. I didn't know what it was going to be to start out with, so I started writing. I started putting thoughts down. I started trying to see if anyone would take notice. Eventually, somebody did a little bit. I got paid a little bit to write and then eventually got paid a little bit to scout. And I, I went back and forth between those two paths for a bit. Uh, Seattle really was the one that opened the door for me the widest to really sink my teeth into it. I did get a great start with Texas back in the day, did that. I actually started um, scouting indie ball players, which is wow. about as big of a challenge as you could have, yeah. kind of trying to dig something out of there. But went back and wrote for a bit. But Seattle was really the kind of thing that changed for me. And uh, I owe Tom Allison a lot, who was the VP of scouting at the time, really gave me the opportunity to test the waters and a lot of different things and find out what I was good at. And it kind of all launched from there, got to do the advanced stuff and got to go back and be, be part of the draft room there. So a lot of different intertwined experiences that got me here today. Frankie, we, we have to get into the man cave. I know for the people that are listening to this over the radio, uh, he has quite the man cave set up behind him. Uh, we will get to that later because we got to go through the serious questions first, Frankie. Um, just six seasons in Seattle. Why was it the right time to come to Miami? Yeah, it was it was not easy. I'll start with that because I was very comfortable with Seattle, with the people, relationships there. And it was it was a special place to me. For that reason, because a lot of people that gave me opportunities, gave me opportunities right. to you learn You tend to things. be loyal there. Yeah. And it's people that were adjacent to me, above me, analysts in that office that sort of like opened the game up to me in a lot of ways. Because until I got to Seattle, most of my experience was just sort of self-taught, being at the ballpark, scouting. Once I got there, I was surrounded by really, really smart, bright people with varied backgrounds. And it was just it was kind of a playground for me to ask questions sure. and I really enjoyed that. And so that, that was tough, but to me, the, the Miami, Miami opportunity, obviously the opportunity to run a draft room, be a director is a great opportunity, but it had to also be the right spot for me. And just a lot of the things that Peter was talking about and the things that seem to be valued here right now were, were appealing to me because I scouting is a puzzle to me and it's, it's never going to be fully solved but I love the idea of chasing it and trying to get as close as we can. And that was really what was appealing to me is because I think there's kind of a, a really good jumping off point to do that here. What were some of those values that you and Peter saw eye to eye on? I think mainly that scouting can be not necessarily reinvented, but reimagined, re-envisioned because it's something that it lends itself to, to become, it's a very, it's a very, it's an old institution in a lot mm. of ways. And, and that's not a bad thing. I came up under a lot of those people, you know, that trained me and mentored me. But I think it's the teams that if you're constantly rethinking and reiterating, maybe there's a better way to do it. Maybe there's a better way to pursue evaluating a player. That's what really appeals to me. People that are sort of obsessed with the idea of never being done with the concept of breaking down an amateur player. Because it's one of the hardest things in baseball, probably one of the hardest things in sports to figure out an 18 to 21 year old. Frankie Pilleri with us now. He's the new Marlins director of amateur scouting. Yeah, let's dive deep into the scouting because there's so many different ways that you can look at a player. What is sort of um what is sort of your way to to look at a player and just I guess give us a, a little bit of that day to day and and how your job kind of runs. Yes, especially in my chair that I'm in now, it is very much a balance of of process and actually scouting the player. And I I look at it as there are two parts of the year, essentially. There's information gathering, and then you get down to the decision. And it's something I, I preach to our guys in the field. I'm starting to do that here, where it's, let's not try to put the decision before the information gathering. It's a long year, and sometimes in 
some players cases years that we're gathering information it's very important it sounds cliche to say to just be meticulous take our time be adjustable because we're dealing with players that change constantly Absolutely. they're changing in life they're yep. we started watching them when they're 16 and 21 22 they're evolving constantly so we need to be pretty adjustable and nimble in the way we're evaluating so i preach a lot of things that are very methodical in the way we scout um Sometimes, obviously, you have to go into a ballpark and make a decision on a player, but try to always try to balance those two things. Let's gather all the info, and when we get down to it, we're going to have a lot of intense, hard conversations about how to break down all the different lenses that exist in scouting now, but taking our time to get there, because we do have time. It's it's the luxury we do have. We might as well use it. I, I believe pretty strongly in a lot of different opinions, and I, I push our, I'm going to push our scouts here to be bold in your opinions because we're going to arrive at something in aggregate at the end that I think we're going to be pretty happy with, but yep. we have to be aggressive on these guys and just throw our dart. What are some of the green lights in a player for you? You know, we value makeup pretty strongly. Like, cause I think you think about the journey that a baseball player has to go through. It, it is very different than a lot of other sports. It is, you know, something I'll often say to a player, heading into the draft because oftentimes we have a chance to interview them at the combine or somewhere else is kind of shedding some light of what their early life is going to be like in minor league baseball. It's sometimes there's nobody watching. It's really hot, whether it's Florida or Arizona, it's not that glamorous at the outset. And maybe for the first time in their lives, they're going to struggle. Even, you know, the Bryce Harpers of the world at some point it's going to happen and how ready are are they going to be when that moment comes is a big, big part of it. Cause for the most part, especially the players that I'm seeing at the top of the draft, they have the requisite tools. They they're athletic. They have power arsenals if they're a pitcher, but what we can find out about them are how ready are they mm. when those challenges come up, I think is a really, really big part of it. And it, I think all scouting directors will tell you that, but it's, it really can't be overstated because they're going to fail. They're going to struggle. What happens when they do? Thank you for with us now, the New Marlins Director of Amateur Scouting. Uh, a couple more left with you, and then we'll lighten this thing up. Um, just with, um, I think as a, as a scout, you you have certain phrases. I'll, I'll just give you like Skip Schumacher is constantly talking about, uh, he hates when guys say, you know, this guy is a finished product, right? He never believes that you're a finished product. You can always improve. You can always get better. You can always dig deeper. Do you have any of those things, how you look at a player or any of those sayings that kind of have stuck with you throughout your time in baseball? You know, it's funny. Like I think about, I think about the term ceiling or upside quite a bit and the different interpretations of that term. I think in a lot of ways it can come from a lot of different places. I really like the term if it's used properly, because I think a lot of times it's naturally associated with everybody with big tools and they can really run and they're athletic. That has upside. That has ceiling. Sometimes ceiling comes from unusual places. Uh, I think about, you know, a player like Jose Ramirez, probably when he was first coming up through the system, like you don't necessarily look at him and see a toolsy, super athletic looking player, but he probably outplayed a lot of the projections that people had on him coming sure. up through because the hit tool was so potent and there were probably certain tools that were under, underestimated. So that's one that pops into my head quite often is because I think it can be can come from so many different avenues. The idea of ceiling or upside or potential, the different ways that dials can be turned to make players that are at the outset prospects that turn them into something even better than what we thought. Very good. All right, let's get away from baseball for a second here. Just yeah. things that you like to do in your free time, TV shows, favorite foods, hobbies. Give us something and we can play off, Frankie. Oh, like I think anybody who knows me, I'm I'm sort of a movie quote guy. Seinfeld. <laughs> uh, I'm a, I, I think I've joked to my wife and friends at times that half of my vocabulary and phrasings that I'll say are probably some version of a Seinfeld quote. But that uh, that kind of is the set. It's kind of the heart <laughs> of my humor for the most part. Very good. All right. I really appreciate the time, Frankie. Great, you know, great to have you. Good luck this season. I'm excited to meet you in person. And thank you again for carving out time. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me.